reading history about people who made a difference. People who saw a problem and wanted to meet the problem, fix it, solve it, answer the question. Uh, one of the people I was reading about most recently that made me uh, appreciate people who see a problem and who want to stand up and fix it was a woman named Rosa Parks. Many of you know she was an African-American civil rights leader, best known probably for her pivotal role during the Montgomery bus boycott. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa was sitting on a row of the bus in the colored section when the bus driver came up and ordered her to vacate the row because the white section was full and she needed to give her seat up for a white man. And she refused. She refused to give up her seat. She refused to go to the back of the bus. And because of her courage, eventually a lawsuit ensued and bus segregation was deemed unconstitutional. You can't do it. I mean, today we, we just can't even comprehend that. We cannot comprehend getting on public transportation and having a white-only section. But just 66 years ago, that was the reality for many people. But Rosa Parks said, I see a problem, and I'm not just going to complain about it. I'm not just going to moan about it and groan about it. I'm going to do something about it. And maybe that day she thought what she was doing was very small, but it became a very significant contribution to civil rights in our country. And you know, often whenever I look at my own life, I find an easy tendency for me to groan and moan and complain about the evils of our world or the problems of our world. And yet I don't really at times want to be a part of the solution to those problems. Maybe I can feel insignificant and I think I can't make a difference. Or sometimes, let's just be honest, it's just easier to complain than it is to actually roll up your sleeves and get involved. And it's also easy for the human heart to complain and moan, not just about the affairs of our world and the problems and the, the evils of our world. It's easy for us to complain to God. It's easy for us to moan and groan to God. And there's nothing wrong with coming to God with our complaints. There's nothing wrong at all with coming to God with our concerns. In fact, uh, often we see people and we hear ourselves asking these questions, uh, questions like, God, are you even listening? God, are you listening? Because when we cry out to help, we want to know, is he there? And then we ask, God, have you forgotten me? Sometimes it feels that way. God, you don't seem to be concerned about me. Have you forgotten about me? Or we ask the question, God, do you see what's happening? God, are you awake? Are you aware of this problem, this pain, this evil, this situation? Or God, are you aware of this issue even at all? We ask those kind of questions. And has it ever occurred to you that the answer is yes, God is aware. As a matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 2, we see the people of Israel have been in bondage in Egypt for coming on 400 years. Whenever they first appear in Egypt, it's a good thing. They're being saved from a famine that could wipe out a small family of 70 people. But eventually things go from good to bad. And then from bad to worse. Because as the people of the children of Israel, the Hebrews, experience, multiply and grow and expand in Egypt, eventually they become a threat to the Egyptians and they throw them into slavery. And they start crying out to God, God, don't you hear us? In fact, listen to this, Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. It says, during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned. There's the word groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Nothing wrong with that. That's the right thing to do. When you've got a pain or a problem, you ought to run to God. Bring it to Him. Talk to Him about it. And it says their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. God heard them. Look at verse 24. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel... And God knew. 
There's the answer to the questions. God, are you listening? Have you forgotten me? Do you see what's happening? Are you aware of this? There's the answer. The Bible says God heard, God remembered, God saw, God knew. And that is not only then in the 1400 B.C. It is also true today in the 21st century A.D. We still have a God who hears, who remembers, who sees, who knows. And he's got a plan for redemption and for rescue. But has it ever occurred to you that he may want you to be a part of the plan of fixing the problem? He may want you to be the answer to your prayers. God may want you to be a part of the solution. God may want you to go from just cursing the darkness to actually lighting a candle and making a difference. That's what we're going to see today as we continue in our study of the Old Testament book of Exodus. That the children of Israel are groaning and God does have a plan. And part of his plan is to include people in solving the problem. There's one particular person he's going to call by name. And his name is Moses. And that's what I want to talk to you about today here in Exodus chapter 3. If you have your Bible, I'm going to put these verses on the screen. They're on our website under the sermons notes tab. Um, But there's just nothing like seeing these verses with your own eyes from your own copy of God's Word. So maybe you want to open it up or turn it on to uh, Exodus chapter 3 beginning with verse 1. And we'll see how God comes to Moses with a call on his life. To be a part of the solution. And I believe in my heart that there are people in this room this morning. And there are people watching us online today. Or listening to this. Whom God is calling. To make a difference in this world. For his glory. And you need to be ready to surrender to the call. But we'll notice something about Moses. He's a lot like us. So let's begin starting with Exodus chapter 3 verse 1. It says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. He is in a land called Midian now, not Egypt. And he is tending his father's sheep. He is no longer the prince of Egypt, adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in that household of Pharaoh, educated with the best educators Egypt had to offer No, 40 years earlier, he has taken matters into his own hands and he said, I don't want to be known as Pharaoh's son. I want to be known as a Hebrew. And he identified with the Hebrews, choosing affliction with them rather than the pleasures of Egypt and the pleasures of sin for a season. The problem, though, when he was 40 years old and made that decision to identify with the Hebrews, he also got a little arrogant And he took matters into his own hands. There was a time the Bible tells us that he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. And it infuriated Moses. Moses had a strong sense of justice. And so the Bible says Moses looked this way and he looked that way. And then he killed the Egyptian. And he buried his body in the sand. Hoping no one would find out. The next day comes and Moses once again sees a fight, but now it's not between an Egyptian and a Hebrew, it's between two Hebrews, his own kinsmen, his own people, and they're fighting with each other. And Moses wants to once again be a deliverer, be a savior. So he steps in and he tries to break up this argument. And one of the Hebrews said, who do you think you are? Who made you prince over us? Are you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? And Moses goes, oh no. What I did yesterday that I thought was a secret has been found out. It can't be long before Pharaoh hears what I've done and he is going to put a bounty on my head. And that's exactly what happened. Pharaoh found out. Pharaoh said, I want Moses dead because of what he's done. And Moses, at the age of 40, flees for his life to a foreign land called Midian. There he meets his wife and he's married and he starts a family. And for 40 more years... He is out in the wilderness tending sheep. He went from being a hero to a zero overnight. And that's where we find him here. Now Moses is 80 years old. 
and the Bible says he is tending his father-in-law's flocks there on the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Mount Horeb. It's the mountain we know better as Mount Sinai. And the Bible says in verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. God appeared to Moses in the form of the angel of the Lord in the midst of a burning bush that was not consumed. This was not anything unusual to Moses to see a bush on fire out in the wilderness. What was unusual was this bush is on fire, but it's not being consumed by the fire. This is a miracle. This is God getting Moses' attention. Moses has never seen anything like this. And God is seeking to get Moses' attention to put a call on his life. And by the way, I want to point something out. Sometimes we read these miracles in the scriptures and we say, well, you know, if I saw a burning bush, then I'll follow God. But, you know, God just doesn't speak to me that way. Listen, it's rare that God does these kind of things. This in scripture is the only time God spoke through a burning bush to a person. So if you're going to sit around waiting on this, you might be waiting for a long time. The point is not how God speaks to us. The point is God does speak to us. Our lives are filled with burning bush moments. Maybe it's a sermon. It's like the preacher was preaching only to you and it was nothing more than the call of God on your life to be saved or to surrender your life to ministry or to be a missionary or to plant a church or to go and share the gospel with a lost co-worker. It could be a move from one city to another where God just does something to get your attention. It could be an illness or a problem. God uses all kinds of ways to get our attention. But look at verse 3. Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight while the bush is not burned. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Once God knew Moses was interested, it wasn't going to just turn his back on the work of God, Moses, God then spoke to Moses. Verse 5, here's what God first says. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you were standing is holy ground. In that ancient culture, to take off your shoes was to show reverence and respect for a place of significance or a place of holiness. And God is saying, I am uniquely manifested here on this ground, in this place, at this moment. Moses, don't forget who I am. Don't forget who you are. Take off your sandals. You are in the presence of God. You're standing on holy ground. And then God reveals to Moses who he is. Verse 6. And he said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God wants Moses to know, I'm not a false God. I'm not a figment of your imagination. I am the one true living God, the covenant-keeping God of your ancestors. Verse 7, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who were in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. Do you hear this? I have seen, I have heard. Look at verse 8, he continues I know, or verse 7, I know their sufferings. Verse 8, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. God says to Moses, I've seen, I've heard, I know, I've come down, I'm going to deliver I've got a plan. And maybe deep down in his heart, Moses is thinking, that's good, God. I'm glad you've got a plan. It's about time. It's been almost 400 years we've been in slavery. It's about time you showed up to do something. But he's not ready for what God is about to do. God is about to say, Moses, I want you to be a part of the solution. Look at verse 9. And now, this is God speaking, and now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. 
Verse 10, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God says, Moses, I want you to be a part of the solution. The first time you took matters into your own hands, you didn't ask me what my plan was. You didn't pray. You didn't seek my face. You just ran headlong into your plan and you made a mess of things. But I've had you in the wilderness these last 40 years so you can earn your BS degree. And that doesn't stand for a Bachelor of Science. It doesn't stand for maybe a lot of what you're thinking. It stands for be silent, be still, be spiritual. Let me get you ready now to be a part of my plan. And now, Moses, you're ready. I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people. They're not your people. They're my people, God says, the children of Israel out of Egypt. God says, Moses, I want you to be a part of the solution. And can I tell you, our God has not changed. He still wants his people to be a part of his plan, to be a part of the solution to the problems of this world. He wants this church to be a part of the solution for the problems that we see in our culture. It is not enough to sit in the dark. We need to light a candle and say, God, send me. What do you want from me? How do you want to use me to make a good difference in a bad world? You say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. Well, I can't tell you specifically what he wants you to do, but I can tell you this. God's heart is connected to the afflicted people of this world, the enslaved people of this world, the ensnared people of this world, the oppressed people of this world, the exiled people of this world, the suffering and miserable people of this world. They have God's attention. They have God's heart. And he wants us to go and to be a part of the solution to their problems. God's redemption of his people of Israel out of ancient Egypt is also a picture of a greater redemption, the redemption of men and women and boys and girls out of the slavery of sin. And the deliverer is not Pastor Ricky or Fort Caroline Baptist Church or, God forbid, the Southern Baptist Convention or any other denomination. The deliverer is none other than Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. But God has called us to be a part of his plan To go and tell people there is a God who knows, who loves you, who cares, who has a plan. Follow him. There's a promised land he has for you. And we forget that it can't just be about doing good deeds in our world, as good as that is. Those good deeds must also become a platform for us to share the good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation. Paid for by his death for us on the cross of Calvary. You would think Moses would be ready to go after what we saw him 40 years earlier. But he's not ready to go because in the back of Moses' mind, he can relive that failure all those years earlier. And he's feeling the weight of his failure as if God could never use him again. And maybe someone here feels like Moses. You've had a failed marriage. And you say, God can't use me from here. I'm damaged goods. Maybe you've had financial failure. Maybe you failed in business. Maybe you failed in your academics and you, you, you failed at school. Maybe you failed in your sobriety and you say, could God ever use someone like me? Well, let's see what the answer is because I believe your past failures don't have to be final. They didn't have to be final for Moses. Yeah, he messed up, but God is a God of a second chance. And listen, take it from me. He's a God of a million chances. He's been so good to me and so patient with me. And he's given me so many chances to get it right after I've made a mistake. That he is a God of grace and mercy and patience. But Moses starts making excuses for not serving God. And I want to reveal these five excuses to you in these next few verses. Uh, Go to Exodus chapter 3 verse 11. Exodus 3 verse 11 it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? Excuse number one, I'm unworthy. Who am I, God? I'm a failure. 
I'm washed up. I'm a nobody. I went from being a prince in Egypt to a shepherd of sheep, not even working for myself, but working for my father-in-law. Who am I that you should choose me to go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God, I'm a nobody. And God, in case you have forgotten, I'm 80 years old. I'm too old now to do this. I'm unworthy. And what is God's response to I'm unworthy? Look at Exodus 3 verse 12. He said, God said, but I will be with you. That's a good phrase. You ought to underline that. You ought to hang on to that verse. You're going to need that in the future. But I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people of up out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. God says, Moses, it's not about you being worthy. It's about my grace making you worthy. You're not going to Pharaoh with your resume in hand. You're going to Pharaoh not in your authority, but in my authority. Not in your power, but in my power. I will be with you. And when I'm with you, you're worthy. You're somebody. I've got a plan for you. And can I tell you, friend, that's good news for me because God's call on my life and God's call on your life is not about who you are. It's about who he is. God's sign to Moses is one day you're going to have a sign, you're going to have a miracle that will prove you were called by me. When you've led my people out on this very mountain where I've appeared to you in a burning bush, you're going to come back with all the people of Israel and you're going to worship me here on this holy mountain, the mountain of God. But notice something. The miracle would only come after Moses obeyed God. We want the miracle first. Prove it to me, God. And God says, no, you've got to live by faith, trust I'm with you, and then you're going to get your vindication afterwards. First the cross Then the resurrection. First there might be some groaning, but then comes glory. I'm unworthy. Now Moses gives the second excuse. Go to Exodus 3 verse 13. Then Moses said to God, (laughs) Moses has got few excuses. If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? If excuse number one is I'm worthy, excuse number two is I'm uncertain. I don't have all the answers. God, if they ask me questions about who you are, who do I tell them you are? I don't know enough about you, God. I don't have all the answers, God. I don't know enough scripture, God. I've never been to seminary, God. What am I going to say to them? See, Moses knew that in Egypt there were multiple gods that the Egyptians worshipped. You had the god Amun, the god of the wind, his great palace in Thebes. You had the god of Osiris, who she, she was the, or this god was the god of death and the god of the Nile River. So, so God, whenever I go to my people and say, God's appeared to me, they're going to say, what's his name? Who is he? What city is he from? Where is his temple? What am I going to say? And here's God's answer in verse 14. God said to Moses, this is a key verse in all of Scripture, by the way. This is a pivotal verse. God said to Moses, I am who I am. You say, that's bad grammar. That's good theology. God says, you want to know my name? You want to go know what you tell them when they ask you who sent you? You tell them, I am has sent me to you. Did you see that? And he said, you say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This is God's way of saying, I'm not one of many gods out there. I am God. And my name can't be limited to a shrine, to a place, to a temple. In fact, if you want to know who I am, I am that I am. I am the uncreated, self-existing, eternal creator and sustainer of the universe. There is no other God besides me. I am. 
This is a tremendous theological statement that we don't have time to unpack this morning. And even if I could, my finite brain cannot do it justice to explain to you the one true, living, uncreated, self-existing, self-sustaining, all-powerful, all-knowing creator and sustainer of the universe. You expect me to explain that to you? All I know is he is, I am. And And this is a theological statement that Jesus used of himself in the Gospel of John I think it was chapter 8, where the self-righteous Pharisees were bragging about their connection in being right with God because they were children of Abraham, were Jews. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was claiming to be God in flesh. And Moses is saying, I'm uncertain And God says, all you need to know is that the I am has sent you. You go on my authority. I'm unworthy. I'm uncertain. Now Moses gives a third excuse for not wanting to serve God. Exodus chapter 4 verse 1. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Of all kinds of people the Lord's going to appear to, it wasn't you. Now Moses' excuse number three is, I'm unbelievable. And he doesn't mean it in a bragging way. I'm unbelievable. He means it in nobody's going to believe me. And how does God answer him? God answers by saying, I'm going to give you signs, miracles that will demonstrate it's not you. It's me at work. It's not you that pulls off the redemption of my people. It's me. Exodus 4 verse 5. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. He says, I'm going to show you these signs. And God gave him. We don't have time this morning to look at all of them. But God gave him signs. He he first asked him, what's that in your hand, Moses? And Moses says, well, it's a staff. It's a stick. It's what I use to tend the sheep. And God says to him, I want you to throw it on the ground. He throws it on the ground, and that thing becomes a serpent. And Moses flees from it, like I do. Found a snake in my yard, and a friend said, what are you afraid of? That snake won't hurt you. And I said, it'll make me hurt myself, getting away from it. And that's what Moses does, man. He gets away from that serpent, and God says, no, no, don't run. You come back now. And you pick that serpent up by the tail. And when he picked it up by the tail, it turned back into a staff. It was a miracle. It was a sign to the Hebrew people and eventually to the Egyptian people that the one true living God is at work here. The second thing he said to Moses was, hey, take your hand and put it inside your cloak. And Moses did that. And he said, now take your hand out. He took it out. When he looked at it, his hand was filled with leprosy, disease. And God says, now you put it back in your cloak. And he puts it back and he takes it out and it's whole again. It's a miracle. It's a sign that this is God at work. And then God said to Moses, if they won't believe those two signs, you take some water from the Nile and you pour it out on the ground. And so Moses does this and it will become blood on the dry ground. What is God saying? God is saying, I know that you feel unworthy and I know that you are uncertain and I know that you in your own strength are unbelievable when it comes to the Hebrew people or even the Egyptians. But you need to know I am at work. I am a miracle-working, life-changing God. And only I can truly change people's hearts and minds. You do your part by being obedient and leave the rest to me, God says. And that's what Moses has to learn. But Moses isn't finished. Moses has another excuse. Look at Exodus 4 verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Now Moses is excuse number four. I'm unable. God, you're telling me to go and speak to the people of Israel and you're telling me to speak to Pharaoh, the leader of the world's superpower. I'm unable I'm not a good speaker. I'm not eloquent. I don't have what it takes. God asked him a series of questions. 
God says, starts asking him, you know, who's made man's mouth? And, and uh, who makes, whether someone is deaf or can't speak or can't see. God says, you just go and I will teach you what you need to say. By the way, of all the excuses, I can relate to this one. It may surprise you, but I'm the kid that took an F on an oral book report because I refused to stand in front of my class and give the book report. And when God called me to be in ministry at the age of 17, I said, God, you've got the wrong person. I can't do it. I get too nervous. I'm not eloquent. I cry every five minutes when I'm trying to talk about something I'm passionate about. God, you've got the wrong person. And what God revealed to Moses, he also revealed to me. God is asking those questions. Who made man's mouth? Who makes the mute, the deaf, the blind? God's saying, I know your limitations and I chose you anyway. God loves choosing the weak to confound the strong. He loves choosing the simple-minded to confound the wise. And God says, you're going to have to trust me. Exodus chapter 4, verse 12. Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. God says, you just trust me. And whenever anything good comes out of your life, Moses, people will know it was me, not you. That way I get all the glory. But Moses has one more excuse, and this makes God angry. Look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 13. But he said, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. Now he's saying, I'm unwilling. <laughs> God, I've come up with all my excuses. Let me just cut to the chase. I don't want to do it. I'm unwilling to go. Lord, please someone send someone else. The prophet Isaiah later will become famous for hearing God call, who will go for us? And he responds, here am I, Lord, send me. Moses, not so much. Moses, here am I, send somebody else. That's the way church members are. Well, somebody ought to do something about that nursery. Somebody else, not me. Somebody ought to give so we can fix this problem. Somebody else, not me. Somebody else ought to serve. Somebody else ought to teach. Somebody else ought to work in the yard. Somebody else ought to go and help reach our neighborhood. Somebody else, not me. Somebody is the most active church member we got. Somebody will do it. Somebody will pay for it. Somebody will serve. Somebody will serve God. Somebody will help. Moses says, oh Lord, please send someone else. Exodus 4 verse 14. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, you will be, uh, he will be glad in his heart. God says, no more excuses, Moses. Whatever your limitations are, I can overcome them. What I'm looking for out of you, Moses, is not your ability. I'm looking for your availability. Now stop making excuses. And some of us need to stop making excuses of why we can't serve God and we can't make a difference in our world and we can't do anything. It's not about you. God's not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability so that he can use you for his glory and for the good of this world. And here's the bottom line. God's presence makes all the difference. That's the point of all the excuses. God gives one answer to every excuse. My presence, God says, makes all the difference. Whatever your excuse is, my presence makes all the difference. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. But with me, all things are possible. God's presence makes all the difference. And when you start feeling small and insignificant and powerless and, and ill-equipped, you need to remember it cast you back on your deepest faith in God, saying, oh God, you must be with me. Oh God, please, I need your spirit. I need your power. I need your word. I need your guidance. Because without you, I can do nothing. But God, with you, I can do whatever you've called me to do. And I don't want to limit you by my excuses. In church, is there any 
coincidence that before Jesus went back to heaven, he reminded us that out of all the things that we can do in this world, he gives us a great commission. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says, Go therefore, go in my authority. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And listen, Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says, my presence makes all the difference. In Fort Caroline Baptist Church, if we don't hear anything else, we must hear the call of God to reach the lost. He has a plan of redemption. He has a person of redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's got a people who don't need to do the work of redemption. Jesus did that on the cross. But we need to go and share the word of redemption by telling people about Jesus Christ. Well, what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? I don't know the Bible. And you start giving excuses. And God says, stop it. Stop making excuses. My presence in your life makes all the difference in your life. You're going to have to trust me. Let me ask you a question. What would you do if you knew God was with you? What would you do if you knew God was with you? Later in her life, Rosa Parks would say, part of the courage that she found to stand up for what was right was not just that she was tired of the injustice, and being treated like a second-class citizen. But what gave her courage was her faith in God. And she knew that he was with her no matter what happened to her. His, his presence makes all the difference in your life. What would you do? How would you start giving financially if you knew God's with you? How would you start serving? How would you share the plan of salvation with a friend who needs Jesus? How would you stand up and fight injustice if you knew God was with you? Would you surrender to be that pastor he's called you to be? To be that missionary that this world needs? To be that church planter that he wants you to be? To serve in this church and to say, I don't want to just be a spectator. I don't want to just sit home and watch it on TV. I want to get involved. I want to get in the game. I want to be a part of the solution. I want to be the answer to my own prayers. God, use me. Here I am. What would you do if you knew God was with you? That's your homework this week, to start asking yourself that question. What would I do if I knew God was with me? If God's calling me, how should I respond? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for the lessons that you teach us, even through the ancient examples of the Hebrew people and Moses. Because God, you are the great I am. You are the same yesterday, today, today. And tomorrow, we can depend on you. Your presence makes all the difference. So, Father, I pray that we would stop making excuses for not surrendering our lives to you. And we would today step out in faith and obedience, knowing that whatever you've called us to do, you are going to be with us. And you will empower us, and you will bless, and you will guide, and you will direct. And when it's all said and done, you and you alone will receive the glory for all that has been done. Because without you, we could do nothing. Father, I pray that today if there's someone in this place or someone watching online today who needs Jesus, I pray that today they would turn from their sin, believe in Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And today they can know they have the gift of God's forgiveness and eternal life through their faith in Christ. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.